the idea even in Luke 15, we talk about the lost sheep or the lost son or lost coin. All the emphasis on the sheep and the coin and the, the son, when in reality, the whole purpose of it is the successful savior, the successful shepherd, the one who found the sheep, the one who found the coin, the one who found the lost son. And again, all the honor belongs to Christ. I ask you, where is that tabernacle today? It's gone. Where's that, with all the gold of that temple, where is it? It's gone. God has dispersed it. Where's the ark? You know, people are all fascinated. They think somehow they're going to find the ark. You know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Even did a big old movie on it. Everybody likes to watch the thing, but it's gone. Destroyed. We're not, uh, don't, don't expect to find it. God has done away with it. Why? Because Christ is the fulfillment. That all the honor and glory belong to Christ. And, and in the same sense today, we dare not put any confidence in any ceremonies or any rituals or traditions that have been handed down. We're not bought with gold and silver, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that better be where all our hope is. It says there in verse 3, she crieth at the gates. The gates, whether it be of the temple or the gates of the city, these are places where jurisdictions took place. In other words, courts. This, these are places where matters were settled. And people met to, to have heard their, their complaints legally. But even there, where men are judges and judging cases, wisdom cries in the gates because that's true wisdom. You can have all the natural wisdom in the world and miss Christ. But oh, to be there where Christ, even in the gates, <laughs> where men are put in positions of authority to judge other men, and yet how he brings love. How he lays low those that he's purposed to save. So this is why the wisdom of God is to be proclaimed. Because men are dead in the darkness of their hearts. They otherwise would not hear, would not know, were it not for God purposing that this be set forth. Here it says, ye shall know them by their fruits. Now, again, is a verse that's been greatly misunderstood because people will say, well, they're fruits. That's their character. That's how they appear. That's their moral. No. You shall know them by their fruits. The fruits here is speaking of their followers. If you want to find out what a man preaches and professes, ask those that follow him. Well, what is it when they say, oh, he's such a good preacher? Well, tell me what it is you like about him. And I'll tell you, most of the time, you won't hear anything of Christ. That's that fruit, because it says, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? You can't expect anything good to come from these men's ministries, because it's not founded upon Christ. Even so, here every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Here's an illustration taken from agriculture that if the tree is corrupt, if the root is defiled, then you don't expect any kind of good fruit to come from it. It's only that tree that has that pure root that brings forth that good fruit. Well, we know that the only good tree that bears good fruit, Christ himself said, it, it's him. Everything else is evil. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. And here Christ is speaking to this religious generation that had such hatred for him. They called him Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. They called him, said he had a demon, all kinds of things about him. As if he were a corrupt tree. But he's turning this back on them. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Everything that they considered to be good fruit was nothing but corruption. 